I'm going to go over lab one with your notes. Um, I've done this because there's a chance I might not be there for this lab, so I wanted to make sure you had the notes for you. If I am there, then you can just watch this as extra. So here's your lab. Here are the objectives, just like we did in AMP1. I'm going to go through these. Um, I've included the notes that I want you to have in there. Um, I will go back and forth between this and pictures so that you can see, so you can see um, what notes I'm looking for, and then you can also identify cells. Like I said, I'll be going back and forth between pictures. So describe the function of blood. Basically, the function of blood is based on the cells that are in the blood. So as I go through the different cells and formed elements that are in the blood, that will give you their function. So when you break blood into two parts, so let me go here, I go down. When you take blood and centrifuge it, okay, so you put in a centrifuge, what's going to happen is the heavier parts are going to settle to the bottom and the lighter parts are going to come to the top. And what you end up with is what's called a hematocrit, which I'll define later. But the formed elements, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets, we're going to settle to the bottom. And then the plasma that contains mostly water is going to come to the top, okay, is going to come to the top. So the red blood cells will make up the majority of the formed elements. The white blood cells and platelets will make up a small percentage. The plasma, which is mostly water, will make up the rest. All right, so the plasma, which I showed you has a yellow look to it, as you can see in this has a yellow to look to it, is mostly water. Like I said, 92% water. It also contains a variety of proteins, um, some that ha they haven't even identified what they do yet. So examples are aminoglobulins, antibodies, which during the pandemic, I'm sure you've heard about those. So antibodies are located there. Fibrinogen, which is a protein that helps with blood clotting. Uh, there's another one called albumin that helps with osmotic pressure. So there's bunches and bunches of proteins that are located in the plasma. Um, I don't need you to focus on the specific individual ones. Know that there are proteins there, but you do need to know that it is mostly water. And this water, as you learned in lecture, is going to help blood flow. Um, it allows blood to flow smoothly. If you, if you get depleted of water, then the blood becomes uh, thicker and it's not able to flow as well. So the formed elements, um, the reason we don't call these cells is because of these platelets. They are not actually a whole cell. They are kind of like a cell that is broken down into little pieces. So that's why the term formed element is used and not cells. Okay, so red blood cells, and you need to know their scientific name, erythrocytes. There are white blood cells, leukocytes, and platelets that are called thrombocytes. Okay. Those are the formed elements that you're going to see in the blood. So I'm going to go through some notes on each of them, and then I'll show you what they look like. So red blood cells, again, technical word is erythrocyte. Their structure, they're going to be biconcave, so two indentations. They do not have a nucleus, and you'll go into that more in lecture. Their function is to carry oxygen. So 95% of the formed elements, not 95% of the blood, 95% of the formed elements are red blood cells. Okay, so not 95% of the blood, 95% of the formed elements. So how do gender differences make a difference in erythrocyte value? Males are going to have a higher percentage of erythrocytes than females due to the testosterone they produce. That testosterone increases production of red blood cells. White blood cells, leukocytes, their general function is immunity. Together with platelets, they make up 5% of the formed elements. So let me go back to this picture. So here are the formed elements from here down. 95% of the formed elements are red blood cells. The last 5% here are white blood cells. This layer where you can see the white blood cells and platelets is called the buffy coat. Okay, it's called the buffy coat. In a healthy individual, it's actually somewhat hard to see because it's such a thin layer and it's white between the red blood cells and the plasma. All right, so white blood cells. There are several different types. Again, I'm going to go through these, and then I will show you a picture. So there are what are called agranular leukocytes. What this means is when they stain, there are no granules, uh, no little dots around the nucleus that you see. So lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell. They make up about 20 to 40% of the white blood cells, of white blood cells, okay, not of all the blood, but of white blood cells. Monocytes. Again, I'll go through structure in a minute. They make up 2 to 8% of the white blood cells. Those are a granular. Okay. 
granular leukocytes, what happens when you stain them, and the blood smears you're going to look at have been stained, you'll get these little granules or these little dots around the nucleus within the cytoplasm of the white blood cell. We have neutrophils, which make up 40 to 60 percent of the white blood cells. Eosinophils, also known as uh, acetophils, these make up a very small percentage, only 1 to 4 percent of the white blood cells. And basophils make up even a smaller percentage, 0.5 to 1 percent of the white blood cells. So in the blood smears you're going to look at, you have to identify neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. You do not have to identify eosinophils or basophils. And that's because they're so rare that they're very high, hard to find in a blood smear. Now, you have to know the percentages of each. The way to remember the order from most abundant white blood cell to least abundant white blood cell, and you can come up with your own saying, the one I use is never let Millie eat beans. Okay. So order from highest to lowest, the percentage of white blood cells, neutrophils the highest, lymphocytes next, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. The last formed element are called platelets or thrombocytes. Again, these are pieces of cells. They're almost going to look like dust when you look at a blood smear, and their function is blood clotting. And again, along with the white blood cells, they make up 5% of the formed elements. Okay, they make up 5% of the formed elements. So let's go to this picture. Okay, so again, here's your formed elements. The majority are red blood cells, erythrocytes. The last 5% are white blood cells and platelets. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Now let's go look, let's try to look, at a blood smear. Oh, I'm trying. Give me a second. That's not going to work either. All right, so let me click over here. All right, so here's in general what these cells look like. Okay, red blood cells, they're going to be very easy to pick out on a slide because they're going to be the most abundant in a healthy person and they're going to appear red, shockingly, All right? And they've got this, here's one of the concaves, so it's kind of like a lifesaver, but without a hole in the center, how they indent. Platelets, like I said, are going to be very, very small, and they're going to kind of look like dust. So if you look in a microscope, and it says identify the formed element, and it looks like a piece of dust, then you're going to put a platelet or thrombocyte. Now the white blood cells, the white blood cells, is what you need to hear is the lymphocytes. Okay, what a lymphocyte looks like, it's a cell, and it looks like it's full of a nucleus, like the whole cell is almost a nucleus. So pretty much what you're going to see, and this is the color it's going to stain. It's going to stain this, the nucleus is going to stain this purple color. Um, macrophage, just ignore that, but the lymphocyte, it's going to look like the cell is the nucleus. That's a lymphocyte. Okay. A neutrophil is going to look like it is multinucleated. So each of these, it looks like an individual nucleus, but it's not. It is a single nucleus that is connected by these extensions, but it's going to look like it has a bunch of nuclei, and it doesn't. It's just one. So they're all going to look slightly different, but they're all going to look like they're multinucleated. A monocyte is going to appear bigger than the other cells. It's going to appear bigger, and it's going to have this large nucleus, but it's going to kind of be shaped like a horseshoe like a, or a kidney. Think of a kid, what a kidney looks like. It's going to kind of be shaped, the nucleus is going to kind of be shaped like a kidney. It's going to be bigger. So a monocyte is going to be larger usually than a lymphocyte or a neutrophil. The eosinophil and basophil, you don't need to identify in a blood smear, but you need to identify a picture of them. So they are granulocytes. Okay, remember we talked about that. The granulocytes I'm talking about are these little purple dots you see here. So this is a basophil. A basophil, these dots, the granules are going to look more purplish. The nucleus looks purple, but so do the granules. In an eosinophil, you have this nucleus, which is purple, but the granules are going to have that red color. So erythro, eo, that means red. So that's these granules that are red. So these two just identify by a picture. These, you still need to know what a picture looks like, as with these two. Again, this one, just ignore. That's actually something we're not going to have to identify. It's a different type of white blood cell. Okay, so when we look at a blood smear... This is what it's going to look like. So the most abundant of the formed elements is going to be these red blood cells. Okay, so they're pretty easy to pick out. Then you look for platelets. Platelets, there you go, that little piece of dust right there. There's a platelet. I actually don't see another one, but that's a platelet. Okay, so if you've got a speck of dust, 
That's your platelet. All right, a lymphocyte. Here's an example of a lymphocyte. Here's a cell, it's that purplish color, it's a white blood cell, and you'll notice it looks like, and it is, the nucleus takes up a large portion of the cell, okay? Just ignore that, my cats are getting, my cats are being feisty. Okay, they've been so good for these until up to this point. A monocyte, the cell is gonna look bigger, okay? The monocyte tends to be bigger than the other white blood cells, and you get this, again, kidney shape type of nucleus, okay? This kidney shape type of nucleus. So we have a lymphocyte, a monocyte. Here's your neutrophil, okay? You see this, it looks like it has more than one nucleus. So that is your neutrophil. And again, that's gonna be your most abundant. This one, just ignore that. All right. The eosinophil, again, you don't have to identify it in a smear, but here it is. And again, they're rare. So it looks kind of like this with these red granules and the basophil has these purple granules. But again, you don't need to worry about those two in a smear. You do need to know what they look like in a picture. So that's what they look like in a smear. Okay, that's what they look like in a smear. Again, I don't know if you can hear my cats, but they continue to make noise. They're not getting along very well. Okay, so two abnormalities you need to identify in a slide, and these are pretty easy, um, pretty easy to look at or look for. So here is what is called sickle cell anemia, which is the most prevalent genetic disorder in people of an African descent. Um, white red blood cells normally look like this. Okay, you see them here. Sickle cell, what happens is there's a genetic abnormality in, for their hemoglobin, for the protein hemoglobin. We'll talk about that in lecture. And what happens is their red blood cells can kind of fall or collapse into the sickle shape. Now, the shape of red blood cells allows them to travel easily through very small blood vessels like capillaries. What happens when they collapse like this, they do not flow well through them, and they actually get stuck in small blood vessels and can cause the blockage of blood flow, which can cause tissue death, causes a large amount of pain. Um, it usually happens, sometimes it can happen, it seems, for no reason, but it can mostly happens in a low oxygen state, which will make more sense with lecture. So that is sickle cell. So if I ask you on a cell, on a question, what abnormality is this? If you see these shapes, cells, then it's sickle cell anemia. The second abnormality, and here is a normal blood smear. Okay, so here's a normal blood smear. So if you notice this, you don't see those sickle shapes. Okay, you see a lot of red blood cells. You see some platelets in here, and then you see a different type. These are actually all neutrophils, okay, that you see, which would make sense since they are the most abundant white blood cell. So again, you go back to this, you see these sickle shapes. You know, if I say abnormality, you have a choice of two answers, sickle cell or leukemia, okay? So if you see that sickle cell, now look at this and look at the percentages, get an idea of the amount of red blood cells compared to platelets and white blood cells, and then you go to this slide. Right. You go to this slide. What you notice, it pretty much sticks out, as much as anything can stick out, is a large number of white blood cells, and that's what leukemia is. And again, we'll talk about this in lecture, but leukemia is a cancer of white blood cells. So the person is making a large number of abnormal white blood cells. Now, there's different types of leukemia depending on what type of white blood cell is affected, but for here, you just need to know that you get a large number of white, abnormal white blood cells, and when you look at this slide, again, it looks much different, okay? It looks much different than the normal blood smear. So two abnormalities, sickle cell or leukemia, okay? So those should be relatively easy to identify. Okay, so what are antigens and antibodies? I have notes here. I'm gonna go through the notes. I'm gonna go through them quickly. There is a separate video that I have done in the past that goes over blood typing, okay, blood typing. So antigens are proteins on cell membranes that can induce an immune response. Antibodies are part of the immune system. If the antibody fits the antigen, it's going to attack it, okay? It's going to attack it. You have different types of blood types. I'm just gonna let you look at these notes. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time with it because you'll watch the other video and plus I will go over it with you, but it lists the type A, B and AB and O blood types, what type of antigens they have on their red blood cells and what type of antibodies they have in their plasma. 
when you are doing a blood transfusion, when you are giving a person a recipient, they're the recipient, they're getting the blood, you're giving it from a donor, and you're giving it to the recipient. In order to not mistype blood, okay, you hear about, oh, they have to give you the right type of blood. If they mistype blood, what happens is antibodies will attack the antigens. So you don't want the antibodies of the recipient to match the antigens of the donor. Now, if we haven't gone over this yet, or you haven't watched the other video, this is going to kind of be confusing. But you don't want the antibodies of the donor that's in their plasma, you don't want those antibodies to match or fit the antigens, okay, to fit the antigens. If the antibodies fit the antigens, they will attack it, and the blood will clump and get stuck and cause tissue death and usually lead to death. Okay. So there's a video on YouTube. You can watch that, plus I will go over it, so I'm not going to go over it again here. This chart tells you who can give to who. So the donor can type A, give to type A. Yes, they can. Can type B, give to type A. No. Can A, B, give to A. No. Can O, give to A. Yes, they can. So this goes through. Here's your donor. Here's your recipient. So this might be helpful to look at after you've gone through the details of blood typing, okay, of blood typing. It's also going to ask you what is the most common blood type. Type O is the most common, type A is next, type B is third, and type AB is the rarest. So in all different ethnic groups, you see this different order. You see, the, sorry, you see the same order where type O is the most common, type A is second, type B is third, and type AB is the rarest. But it differs in percentages. So with some percentages, with African Americans, there's a higher type percentage of type O than in people of European descent, but again, it's still the most common type. The second form of blood typing is RH. So when you get your blood type, you hear O positive, O negative. If you are O or if you are RH positive, so no matter A, B, A, B, or O, you have a plus, a positive after that, that means you have an RH antigen or a D antigen on your red blood cells. So besides the antigens from the A, B, A, B, O type, you also may have a second type of antigen, the RH or D antigen. 85% of the population has the D or RH antigen on the red blood cells. 15% do not. This is also in the video, and I will also go over it. You can go ahead and read this on your own. Where you have an issue is when you have a mother who is RH negative when you have a mother who is RH negative, because most likely her children are going to be RH positive because it's obviously dominant. So if the husband or the father, I should say the father, if the father is RH positive and the mother is RH negative, with the first child, nothing bad may happen. But with the second child, what's happened is the RH negative mother has made antibodies against the RH antigen. And so what can happen with the second child, because the immune response has happened, the mother's blood, her antibodies, may fight off the baby's blood, and that can be very dangerous. And that's called hemolytic disease of the newborn. Basically what's going to happen, the mother's antibodies can fight or, or destroy the baby's blood, okay, depending on the blood type. So again, we'll go over that, and it's also discussed in the video. You can read that on your own since you have this lab. Okay, so determine a person's blood type. We'll do that in class. The difference between coagulation and agglutination. Coagulation, which we'll talk about in lecture, is the process that occurs with bleeding. So when you cut yourself, there's a process of a bunch of proteins going through a process of coagulation to form a clot to stop that bleeding. Okay, to stop that bleeding. So coagulation is to stop bleeding, you form a clot. Agglutination is an immune response, and it deals with blood typing. If you mistype blood, okay, let's say you give type A blood to type B, and those antibodies are going to attack those antigens, that is an immune response, that is agglutination. What will happen is 
the blood will actually clump, not clot. It will clump, and you'll have this large clump of blood that will get stuck in blood vessels and can lead to death. So agglutination is an immune response when you mistype blood or mismatch blood. Coagulation is blood clotting with the intent of stopping bleeding. All right, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein that is located in red blood cells. It is the protein that's going to carry oxygen. The amount, there's a range, and this is very common with a, with a common blood test. Again, you guys are younger, so you may not have had this yet, but the values, you need to know normal values for males and females. You will notice that for females, the normal average is lower. For males, it is higher. Okay. There is some overlap, but males in general are higher. That again comes down to testosterone and producing more red blood cells, which means there's more hemoglobin there. The next test is hematocrit. Hematocrit is the percent of erythrocytes in a blood sample. Let me go back to the same picture. Oops, let me try to go back to the same picture. Here we go. All right, so this is a hematocrit. You take your blood, you centrifuge it, the percent of red blood cells in the whole sample, that is the hematocrit, okay? That is the hematocrit. Those numbers, okay. again, you see the same pattern. There's, there can be some overlap between males and females, but in general, males tend to be higher, and that is primarily, again, because of testosterone producing more red blood cells. So these carry more oxygen. So the higher your hematocrit, the more red blood cells you have, the more oxygen you can carry, okay? The more oxygen you can carry. So that's hematocrit, the percent of erythrocytes or red blood cells in a blood sample. Okay. And that is measured, we will talk about that. That is measured, um, we won't do blood samples, I may do mine, um, but you can do, you can centrifuge your blood down and then measure the percentage of the total blood that is red blood cells, okay? All right, so that's just an overview of the notes. Um, if you're using this because I'm not there, then I will obviously fill in some blanks and answer any questions. If you're using this and I've gone over a lot of this, then this should just kind of reiterate what I've talked about. Again, you need to remember there is a link in Google Classroom for the video on blood typing, and you need to watch that. And again, I will go over it okay, for you. So this may just help you um, determine whether you understand who can give to who, who can give blood type to who, and why. Okay, if you have any questions, please let me know. That is the end.